Um, so I, I am going to try uh, in this uh, paper to talk a little bit about the concept of form directly, um, but I'm going to do so in, in what I hope is a slightly um, perversely productive way by, by looking at the issue of formlessness. So to, 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 to try and think about form from the perspective of uh, formlessness. And th this comes out of a, a couple of things which I'll, I'll talk about in, in, in this paper. One is, as um, Nathan mentioned, the, the work that I've been doing for some time around the novel, the theory of the novel, uh, and in particular in relation with the theory of the novel to capitalism. Um, and being struck by the amount of times that this idea of formlessness turns up um, uh, in theorizations of the novel, particularly in theorizations of the early novel, in the 18th century novel. Someone like Ian Watt, for example, refers on several occasions in, in, the, in his famous book, The Rise of the Novel, um, to the appearance of formlessness uh, in the novel. Um, the, the second one that I'm going to talk about, both at the beginning of the paper and if I get time right at the end, um, is, I suppose, a more contemporary, what I take to be a more contemporary anxiety about form. Um, that I suggest appears on the one hand in um, a discomfort with the idea of fiction in a lot of contemporary writing, a, sp a specific rejection of, um, or, or, or as we'll see, a kind of even a sickness with regard to um, the idea of fiction. And then I suppose on the other hand, various forms of um, things like new materialism, where there seems to be a kind of desire for something like a materiality or a matter um, without form, in which formlessness is kind of affirmed um, as, as an escape from form in favour of some presentation or access to matter or material in itself. I'm only going to talk about that um, if I get a chance very briefly at the, um, the end. The, the other side of this, which relates to this larger project around the novel and capitalism, um, th that struck me listening to what Nathan was saying about the difference between form and structure, is that I suppose without having thought enough about this, perhaps, uh, uh, to articulate it clearly in the paper, but perhaps this is something we can come to in the Q&As, is the persistence of the use of the term form in Marx to think about capitalism. Um, although, of course, structure is very crucial in the ways in which Marxism comes to be uh, philosophized in, in, in the late 20th century, obviously in the work of people like Althusser, um, it's the term form that appears most persistently in Marx, and particularly around ideas of things like social form. Um, so to kind of slightly anticipate what I'm going to try and argue here, um, I'm going to suggest that formlessness, or what appears as formlessness, is in some ways linked to the peculiar characteristics of social form as Marx understands it, and the peculiar kind of um, uh, formalism, we might say, that there is in, in Marx, but, but it's a, a formalism that is precisely a kind of real formalism. I'll, I'll, I'll try and explain that as we go along. Um, so I'm going to read this out. Um, I'm doing it off a computer. Unfortunately, I finished it this morning, so I haven't had a chance to, uh, to print it. Um, but I'll hopefully extemporise a little bit as I go along, uh, and we'll see how we do for time. OK. Um, among the more striking features of recent discourses around literature has been the rejection of and even revulsion towards the idea of fiction that marks the work of several contemporary writers. It just seems so tiresome to make up a fake person and put them through the paces of a fake story. Writes Shel Hetty of her novel From Life, How Should a Person Be? I just, I can't do it. Similarly, citing Milan Kundera's shame at having to name his characters, Laurent Binet begins his first novel centred on the Heydrich assassination with an assertion of the vulgarity of having to give an invented person an invented name while David Shields, author of the manifesto Reality Hunger, simply declares his lack of interest in imaginary beings, calling instead for an art defined by, quote, its deliberate unartiness, raw material, seemingly unprocessed, unfiltered, uncensored, and unprofessional. What, in the last half century, Shields continues, has been more influential than Abraham's Apruda's eight millimeter film of the Kennedy assassination unprocessed, unfiltered, uncentered, unprofessional. As Shields observes, this is a work that of necessity, quote, breaks into fragments. Our lives aren't prepackaged along narrative lines, and therefore, by its very nature, reality-based art, underprocessed, underproduced, splinters and explodes. Perhaps the most interesting and certainly most celebrated of such instances of this splintering 
would be the sixth volume, My Struggle, by the Norwegian writer Carl Ove Nausgaard, and in particular, the essayistic meditation that runs sporadically through the second volume, A Man in Love, in which Nausgaard writes simply of his increasing desire not to write a novel. Just the thought of fiction, writes Nausgaard, just the thought of a fabricated character in a fabricated plot made me feel nauseous. Now, no doubt this can be read in large part, as it can in Binet or Haiti, as a nausea specifically concerning imagination. The fictional as something someone has made up, as Nausgaard puts it further on in the book. But it also reflects rather more broadly, I want to suggest, a widespread contemporary resistance to what Shields reminds us is the etymology of the term fiction itself, from finger, meaning to shape, fashion, form, or mould. For if Nausgaard takes us to one extreme of this, for better or worse, it is less because of his somewhat spurious claims to the non-fictional as such. Nausgaard is, um, those of you who know him, very um, uh, uh, shifty about this, claiming that nothing whatsoever is made up in the book, and yet when people question him on how his memories can be quite so intense, he says, well, of course, I just made it up. Um, anyway, it's less because I think in the precisely of that is somewhat spurious claims to the non-fictional as such, but because, as Ben Lerner puts it, quote, part of what makes Nausgaard's writing unusual is that he barely seems to adjudicate any significance and hence to offer any shaping or fashioning in the ways in which he represents reality. It is less a question in this sense of whether or not the father or brother in my struggle are made up than of the fact that in Nausgaard's prose, the face of a family member, political upheaval and the routines of washing up are each approached with the same apparently egalitarian indifference as to their value or significance. As Lerner observes, the question would be then whether in the midst of its lengthy digression and extremely, at times, almost absurdly detailed description, my struggle ultimately has an, an aesthetic form at all, or is, as he puts it, just one thing after another. It's this idea of the formless as, as, as just one thing after another um, that I partly want to talk about about here. I mean, it's, it's, it's fair to say, of course, that Nausgaard doesn't entirely live up to this. Indeed, it would be one of the questions of whether or not it is possible to live up to this. Um, but in principle, at least, I think what Lerner is rightly suggesting is that one of the effects of reading Nausgaard prose is this odd flattening or levelling out of the significance of the events that he describes. So you can spend ten pages talking about washing up and eight pages talking about the death of a member of your family. And the significance of the two is therefore kind of flattened out. And it's this that for Lerner raises this question of whether or not there is an aesthetic form at all in Nausgaard's writing. As Lerner notes, in the case of Nausgaard's writing, one of the problems then is one would have to exert pages and pages, not a sentence or paragraph, to give an accurate sense of the effect of such an apparent absence of form as itself the distinctive formal feature of the work. Nonetheless, whatever the specific novelty of my struggle, its nausea with respect to fiction as form also seems to recall a number of earlier discussions of realism and of what, in his essay, The Reality Effect, Roman Barth famously describes as, quote, the irreconcilable divorce between lived experience and the intelligible which characterizes modernity. Experience, as Frederick Jameson summarizes Barth's point in his recent Antinomies of Realism, is, according to this account, in modern times contingent. If such experience has a meaning, we are at once suspicious of its authenticity. Or, as Eric Auerbach puts it in his 1933 essay, Romanticism and Realism, while, quote, insofar as it, as it is intelligible, true reality can only be represented as ordered, such order cannot, quote, arise out of the merely programmatic will to orderliness. For any such order would necessarily be too narrow, no matter where the origins of its laws lay would be trying to force reality into a mould. Bless you. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting vocabulary that I haven't talked about here, but it's interesting about the relation of form to mould that comes up again and again in these, these discourses. It would be trying to force reality into a mould. It's essentially Auerbach's um, account of the development of realism. To separate, then he continues, an episode out from the totality of events in the world in a clean way seems necessarily and increasingly, quote, to falsify 
the authenticity of the real. Now, among the most interesting and influential attempts, not least upon people like Adorno and Benjamin and others, to grapple with the apparent dialectic between form and reality or life that emerges from this, and upon which then I want to focus, comes in the early work of Georges Lukács. In his 1908 essay, The Moment and Form, devoted to the Austrian poet and playwright Richard Beer Hoffman, and included in the collection Soul and Form, published when he was 25. That depresses me so much when I realised that um, the essays in Soul and Form were published when he was 25, which means that about half of them were written when he was 23. Can't think what I was doing when I was 23. Uh, anyway, Lukács asserts that, quote, humanity and form are the central problems of all art, if, as he notes parenthetically, admittedly only today. That parenthetical acknowledgement only today, um, as we'll see, is crucial. So to quote, there have been times, at least we believe there have been, when the thing we call form today, the thing we look for so feverishly, the thing we try to snatch from the continual movement of life in the cold ecstasy of artistic creation, was simply the natural language of revelation. In those times, no one asked questions about the nature of form. No one separated form from matter or from life. No one knew that form is something different from either of these. Form was just the simplest way, the shortest path to understanding between two similar souls, the poets and the publics. But, Lukács concludes, today this too has become a problem. The term form is, of course, as Nathan was saying at the beginning, subject to a dizzyingly varied and even contradictory range of uses in modern criticism and theory. No less today, perhaps, than 100 odd years ago, despite our distance from the metaphysical vocabulary of Lukács' early writings. Associated at once with the result of some process of abstraction or even idealization, form as abstracted from any specific content or concrete matter, it is at the same time often identified as that which is the site of a properly concrete or sensuous particularity and thus of a distinctive aesthetic or affective experience that is distinct from the necessary conceptual or semantic aspects of theme or content. In fact, as Caroline Levine notes in her 2015 book entitled simply Form, a brief look at the history of the term shows that, quote, form has consistently gestured to a series of conflicting, even paradoxical meanings. So to quote Levine, form can mean immaterial idea, as in Plato, or material shape, as in Aristotle. It can indicate essence, but it can also mean superficial trappings, such as conventions, mere forms. Form can be generalised in abstract or highly particular, as in the form of this thing is what makes it what it is, and if it were reorganised, it would not be the same thing. Form can be understood as historical, emerging out of particular cultural and political circumstances, or it can be understood as ahistorical, transcending the specificities of history, end quote. Moreover, as is suggested by Levine's own appeal to a new formalism, many of these uses of the term serve not only to identify a particular object of study, method, or field of research, but when affirmed in more partisan fashion, have sought to orient a critical practice that is itself framed alternately either by some opposition to art or literature's supposed reduction to the historical or social, usually in the name of a disciplinary or medium specificity, or as the primary means by which the artistic and social are precisely conjoined through the transdisciplinary or analogical character, what we may understand by form uh, itself. This is the, the route that, um, in fact, Levine herself takes. Still, these apparently contradictory uses notwithstanding, for Levine at least one apparent foundation for a general understanding of form, would she argues reside in the claim that, despite their richness and variety, all of the historical uses of the term do perhaps share a common definition. That is, that form always, quote, indicates an arrangement of elements, an ordering, patterning, or shaping, a, quote, matter of imposing and enforcing boundaries, temporal patterns, and hierarchies on experience. It is this, of course, that connects it to the idea of fiction, precisely as to shape, fashion, form, or mold, or, in Frank Commode's minimal definition, as a sense-making shape. And certainly, it is in something like these terms that Lukács himself, in the essay on Beer Hoffman as elsewhere, declares the most profound meaning of form to be, quote, to mould the directionless, precipitous, many-coloured stream of life. To mould the directionless, precipitous, many-coloured stream of life. 
There is no poetry, as he puts it in 1910, without, quote, some ordering of things. The necessity of form is thus that it sets limits around a substance, Lukács states, which otherwise would dissolve into air like the orb, and so is able to, quote, form something new out of formlessness. Form something new out of formlessness. This is an evidently classical conception, of course. Nonetheless, it is in this sense that the question of why form has become problematic today can be posed, Lukács writes, as first and foremost a conflict between richness and form. To cite again from the 1908 essay, The Moment and Form, quote, what may, what must be sacrificed for the sake of form? Must anything be sacrificed at all, and why? Perhaps, Lukács continues, because the existing forms are not the product of our life today. Perhaps because the existing forms are not the product of our life today, or because our life today is so inartistic, so haphazard, so uncertain and weak, that it is quite incapable of transforming its own ends. Whatever aspect of the existing forms could change with time, and which must be changed if we are to have a living art. And so today, Lukács continues, we either have abstract form, the result of thinking about art, of admiring great works of the past and exploring their mysteries, a form which cannot encompass the specific qualities, the beauties and richness, riches of the art of today, or else there is no form at all. And anything that produces an effect does so simply through the power of shared experience and becomes incomprehensible as soon as the experience is no longer shared. This may or may not be the reason for the conflict, Lukács concludes, but a conflict there most certainly is, and just as certainly there was no such conflict in the really great periods of the past. The tension or conflict marked in this passage between existing forms and our life today evidently articulates on Lukács' part a specifically modernist dynamic of tradition's negation and the concomitant demand to make it new, in which what constitutes form itself is continuously re remade. It's not an alarm or anything, is it? No. Um, but one also recognises in this, of course, the basis of those notoriously melancholic conclusions of Lukács' later and somewhat better known The Theory of the Novel, and of its defining opposition, indebted both to Hegel and early German Romanticism, between the epic and the novel as, quote, differing from one, one another not by their author's fundamental intentions, but by the given historico-philosophical realities with which the authors were confronted. Between, that is, a life today that is so inartistic, so haphazard, so uncertain and weak, and a life that is not. It's a really irritating noise, isn't it? <laughs> no, never mind. I'll carry on. You can, ignore, you can ignore it or you can ignore me, one of the two. Uh, unlike the epic, then, for which form is not a problem or question, since it scarcely appears to be separable as such, in a sense, oh, well done. <laughs> Uh, unlike then the epic for which form is not a problem or question, since it scarcely appears to be separable as such, in a sense the, the novelty of, of Lukács' argument is that um, form is problematic at the point that form is invented. Form is not a problem for the Greeks on this account, simply because the Greeks don't have form. The Greeks don't have form because there is no way of separating form from matter or, or content. Um, so uh, it's the very invention of form, as we'll see, that renders form as a problem and therefore opens up this um, uh, dilemma of, of, of the seemingly formless. Um, unlike the epic then, for which form is not a problem or a question, the novel, writes Lukács, carries, quote, the fragmentary nature of the world structure into the world of forms. The novel carries the fragmentary nature of the world structure into the world of forms. And if the novel is thus the paradoxical and finally impossible epic form of this fragmentary structure, it is because, as Lukács puts it, this is a world, it was our world, modernity, which has itself become infinitely large, and even each of its corners richer in gifts and dangers than the world of the Greeks. As such, it is this very wealth that by virtue of its unending richness, quote, carries out sorry, cancels out the positive meaning, the totality upon which their life was based. No one event, no one narrative, and thus no one form can ever on this account be rich enough. And while we may well be unlikely today to accept the more or less mythical terms with which such fragmentation is posited in the theory of the novel, as Franco Moretti puts it in an early work, 
What is unacceptable here is not so much the description of form as the characteristics attributed to historical existence. This continued to raise the question of the degree to which literary form can be understood as something like a mediation of the social, the carrying of the world structure into the world of forms, the means by which forms of sociality appear somehow within artistic form itself. So there's an interesting way in, in Lukács in which, and this of course is hugely influential on people like Adorno, that the kind of Hegelian, the Hegelian account in theory of the novel um, proposes an account of um, uh, the ways in which social form finds itself um, carried over into artistic or into literary form. Um, but at the same time, that's produced, of course, necessarily for Lukács um, through this melancholic setup in which all of this is framed by a generalized loss of the um, uh, unproblematic nature of form in the Greek world, something that's represented then in the, in, in, in the epic. So it, it's only, in a sense, at the point at which form becomes identifiable as a problem in itself um, that this carrying over of social form into literary form becomes in some ways apparent. In, in that sense, we don't have to, I think, accept the kind of melancholic setup or the kind of mythical conception of the epic or the Greeks in Lukács um, to follow the kind of general argument uh, uh, that, that Lukács is, is making here. Indeed, we could say that that's precisely what someone like Adorno uh, goes on to do. If form here is defined then in the essays in Soul and Form by some intrinsic conflict with life, for modernity at least, the essay on Beer Hoffman appears in this sense as a sketch for the novelistic writer more generally, for whom necessarily, quote, proportions are ruined by the intrusive richness of that reality which the writer or artist must articulate. Form, that is to say, is both necessary to give expression to life or reality, but the very relation that it has to such life or reality simultaneously threatens always to undo the very arrangement of elements, ordering, patterning, or shaping, to quote Levine, upon which form relies. Just as life is what animates the possibility of form making, so for the young Lukács, it simultaneously establishes and points beyond any form's limits. In the remainder of what follows, I want to try then to consider the question of form, less by approaching it from the perspective of what is best meant by form as such, or at least not directly, given that in some sense it is the very contradictory character of its varied articulations, as at once both abstract and concrete that seems of most significance here, but rather negatively of what unworks form, of a certain formlessness, and hence of what might be described as a particular history of anxiety about the changing relations between form and reality, which I take Lukács' writings to be exemplary. In an oft-quoted line from his 1909 essay, The Evolution of Modern Drama, in which he most clearly seems to anticipate his later Marxist concerns, Lukács famously proposes that form is the most truly social element in literature, a sentiment with which, in these broad terms, Levine and other would-be new formalists would evidently agree. The consequent question would be, however, what are then the social dimensions or implications of the apparently formless? What is often felt as the formlessness of the novel, as Ian Watt, for example, puts it writing of Defoe and Christensen, of the formlessness as itself an issue of literary or artistic form, and thus as an expression of historical experience? Now, one means to addressing this question would turn, I think, on the shifting understandings of abstraction and concreteness that traverse Lukács' own discussions of form. The historical proposition in the early Lukács is clear. The Greeks, as he puts it in On the Nature and Form of the Essay, quote, felt each of the forms available to them as a reality, as a living thing, and not as an abstraction. The Greeks felt each of the forms available to them as a reality, as a living thing, and not, therefore, as an abstraction. However, today, Lukács writes, we have either abstract form, a form which cannot encompass the specific qualities, the beauties and riches of the art of today, or else there is no form at all. Consequently, faced with the incessantly changing nuances of life, the chaotic multiplicity of life, Lukács writes in his 1909 essay on Kierkegaard, entitled simply, The Foundering of Form Against Life, Someone like the Danish philosopher's tragic heroism is expressed fundamentally in the fact that, quote, he wanted to create forms from life. As Lukács also writes of Beer Hoffman, the old abstractions are too narrow for what he wants to say. He wants to create new abstractions 
so that his whole lyricism may be dissolved into form. Of all today's writers, he is fighting the most heroic battle for form. But, Lukács continues, in each of his works, the edifice he has so beautifully constructed breaks down at several points, and sudden perspectives open up before us, sudden glimpses of something, who knows what, life? Form founders against life, in other words, or at least against modern life. And for the Lukács of the 1900s, like Nausgaard more than a century later, necessarily so. Yet equally, it's hard not to be struck, as is Judith Butler, for example, in her introduction to the recent new edition of Soul and Form, by what would seem an obvious divergence between this and the later Lukács' particularly emphatic insistence in the name of realism upon precisely the need for a certain kind of form to apprehend the interrelations of social forces amidst the string of apparently unrelated events and details making up capitalist life. Famously, it is this that underpins the pivotal Marxian account of realism developed by Lukács in the 1930s, particularly in his essay Narrate or Describe, which opposes a writer like Zola's, quote, obsession with monographic detail, in which, despite or because of the extraordinary sensuous suggestive power of such detail, the materiality of the world is rendered, quote, transferable and arbitrary, to the capacity of Balzac's or Tolstoy's novels to make us experience events which are inherently significant, and in which the detail must be so selected and so depicted from the outset that its relationship with the totality may be organic and dynamic, end quote. Narration as form establishes proportions, Lukács writes, description merely levels. Consequently, in what he calls the abstract view of Zola and Flaubert, or of Joyce, Dos Passos and Proust after them, quote, life appears as a constant, even tenored stream, or as a monotonous plain sprawling without contours. Sprawling without contours. I want to come back to various aspects of this argument in a moment and the rather different ways in which the abstraction of this abstract view is understood by comparison to the earlier discussions of form as abstracted from life. But in fact, in general terms at least, the kind of anxiety about form that narrates or describe Marx is already apparent throughout the essays making up soul and form, even if the latter seems to allow, as Butler argues, for a kind of vacillation between form and life that is less marked in the later works. So in a sense, in soul and form, it's not clear um, that Lukács necessarily stands ultimately on the side of form over life. In a sense, in soul and form, the interest is in the dialectical relationship between the two, the way in which um, form is produced necessarily out of life. Without life, there can't be any, any form, and yet always founders against life by virtue of its kind of incapacity uh, to complete um, uh, its formation in something like the artistic or literary work. Um, whereas at least the appearance of the later Lukács is that there is a much stronger emphasis upon the necessity of form uh, as a means of shaping and dealing with life. Um, because without that shaping or dealing with life, one is a, unable to get that understanding of the social world, and particularly an understanding of capitalism, that Lukács thinks that realism, unlike modernism or naturalism, uh, is able to provide. Um, one of the things I'm going to, going to try and argue is that it's a, it's a little bit more complicated than that, that standard account. Um, so, for, if life can clearly find no ultimate redemption in form, as Butler notes, still its unworking runs the risk of thrusting the artwork already back into what Lukács, into what Lukács terms vulgar life, a dull, deadweight necessity of the concatenation of outward events that, in Butler's own words, only a certain faith in form, once aesthetic and metaphysical, can however tragically serve to counter. Clearly then, a certain account of abstraction is indeed central to both Lukács' early and late analyses of the very nature of form, both generally and in relation to the novel in particular. Hence, to take one more and final example, what comes to threaten the epic potential of the chivalrous novel in the moment that gives birth to Don Quixote is necessarily accorded a far more general significance in the theory of the novel. Quote, the chivalrous novel had succumbed to the fate of every epic that wants to maintain and perpetuate a form by purely formal means, after the transcendental conditions for its existence have already been condemned by the historico-philosophical dialectic. The, chival the chivalrous novel had lost its roots in transcendent being, and the forms, which no longer had any imminent function, 
withered away, became abstract. So the, the argument here around um, Don Quixote and around the novel uh, uh, more generally in the early Lukács is that um, the attempts to maintain the epic as such in something like the chivalrous novel fail because they want to ultimately maintain what is a form by purely formal means. After the moment at which um, that form was in some ways um, uh, organic to the life which it, which it formed. The, the, the point at which that form is no longer organically linked to the life of which it's formed is the point at which then it becomes abstract. It becomes abstract because the, the form and life necessarily become separated at that point. Form can only be seen to be dumped down, as it were, onto, onto life. Um, the, the, the question, in theory of the novel at least, is whether or not form can ever be anything other than abstract in that sense in the novel. Whether, in, in other words, it's possible to produce new forms that would in some ways be appropriate to modern life, or whether in fact it's simply in the nature of modern life that no form is able to um, uh, achieve what somebody like the Greek or indeed the medieval epic sense of form um, was able to. Um, it seems fairly clear that, that in the early Lukács there's a largely melancholic conception of that. In the later Lukács, that is Lukács from the 1930s in particular onwards, there's um, a much more optimistic sense by virtue of his um, uh, Marxism in the idea that the novel through the form of realism can re-establish a kind of appropriate form in that sense. Um, importantly, anyway, going to, in, in terms of the theory of the novel's account of Don Quixote, this is at this stage, again, an emphatically historical proposition. For if every novel must risk what, in an explicitly Hegelian register, to which I'll return in a moment, Lukács calls bad abstraction, this is not a contingent possibility, but rather a necessary productive logic generated by some abstraction inherent to the given reality of modernity itself, with which the novel as a whole is confronted. Um, I've massively condensed what's really a quite a complicated argument there. Um, there's, there's a kind of double movement, I think, in theory of the novel that Lukács himself doesn't um, unfold entirely um, uh, uh, as he could, which in a sense is that on the one hand, form becomes abstract simply because life itself can no longer be probably mediated by the existing forms in the ways which I've just described. But it also becomes abstract because the very life that is mediating is itself abstract. It's in a sense, it's that second argument that at this point is more, more interesting to me. That in a sense, the, the argument is that form becomes abstract because the life it has to form is itself abstract. Um, which, which raises the question of whether in, in that sense modern form is mimetic in some way of the actual abstraction of life and reality or whether um, uh, its abstraction as form is simply useless in relation to the abstractions of modern life. It, it's, it, it therefore simply becomes a kind of irrelevant, um, uh, 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 detached form set off from or from, the, from the realities of social abstraction. Whereas you, you can read Lukács in two directions there, either, either form as a kind of mimesis of social abstraction or form as simply in some ways a kind of irrelevant detached form in relation to social abstraction. Um, nonetheless, to extend Butler's point, it is true that this can in some key respects tend in the later Lukács to generate a far simpler opposition of abstraction to concrete um, than can be found anywhere in the earlier work. Something apparent both, for example, in Lukács' notorious deployment of the Hegelian distinction between so-called abstract and concrete potentiality as a means of distinguishing modernism from realism, and by the claim that epic form can itself be reclaimed in realism, as it could not in the theory of the novel, via an authentic concreteness now seen as grounded in a history of class consciousness. It is then, no doubt, but a short step from this to an analysis whereby an increasingly simple conceptualization of the concrete and the abstract can be progressively mapped onto the typological, rather than now predominantly historical, division between realism and naturalism or modernism per se, and in which abstraction therefore comes to mean little more in a reading of the latter than a, dis than a straightforward negation of outward reality or attenuation of actuality itself. As Lukács writes of Voringer in the essay Art and Objective Truth, 
abstraction in this sense is simply, quote, a culmination of the subjectivist elimination of all content from aesthetics in the period, marvellous Lukacian phrase, of capitalist degeneration. Form as abstraction becomes, in other words, mere formalism. This, this I, I think, is probably the most, um, the best known account of abstraction in, in Lukács um, in relation to literature. That, that is that um, what happens in, in, in modernism is what he calls here this subjectivist elimination of all content from aesthetics, the, the result of which then is that um, the abstraction of form in modernism simply marks what he calls an attenuation of actuality itself. The example he gives of this is Kafka. Um, so it, on, in, in Lukács's um, anti-modernist, as it were, reading of, of Kafka, Kafka's abstraction, uh, abstraction simply marks what he calls the negation of outward reality, as opposed to the ways in which it is outward reality that's the fundamental concern of the forms deployed in, say, a Balzac or a Tolstoy. Um, so here, then, in other words, abstraction is identifiable with formalism. What, what, what Lukács derides as formalism in modernism, and here, of course, he's following an already established uh, Soviet critique of, of, of formalism in the 1930s. What he calls formalism in the, no in the modernist novel is abstraction in, in, in that simple sense, should we say. Um, what I want to suggest, though, is in a moment is that there's another account of abstraction going on here that, in a way, is, is less known and, and, and more interesting. To understand the historical account which underlies this argument about abstraction, it is worth returning for a moment to the principal source of Lukács' early account of the novel and of form itself in what comprises little more than a page or two of Hegel's aesthetics. Um, I'm going to read from Hegel's aesthetics, which is always a joy. Um, it's quite a long uh, uh, quote. I'll pause in the middle. Um, but it is, Hegel writes, quite different with the novel. Um, this is a passage, it, it, it's, it's about two pages long in the thousand odd pages of the aesthetics. He's spent about 800 pages talking about the development of the epic through the classical, through the medieval and so on. And then there's about two pages of the novel at the end. And all anybody ever reads is the two pages of the novel uh, at the end. Anyway, Hegel says, but it is quite different with the novel, the modern bourgeois epic. The modern bourgeois epic is this famous definition of the novel in Hegel. Here we have completely before us again the wealth and many sidedness of interests situations, characters, relations of life, the wide background of a whole world, as well as the epic portrayal of events. But what is missing is the primitive poetic general situation out of which the epic proper proceeds. What is missing in the novel as an epic is the primitive poetic general situation out of which the epic proper proceeds. Um, this is essentially, then, I think, this, the same argument that Lukács is making around um, uh, the Greeks and form. Um, form only becomes a problem at the point on which precisely it has to be apprehended as form. In what, what uh, Hegel's holding here, the primitive poetic general situation of the epic, form is never a problem simply because the life itself is already poetic to such a degree that form can never be identified as such. Again, I, I'm bracketing off the obvious problems in this account. Um, a novel... Um, Hegel continues, though, in the modern sense of the word, presupposes a world already prosaically ordered. Novel, in the modern sense of the world, word presupposes a world already prosaically ordered. This, I think, is the, 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 the key point in, in Hegel's account of the novel. The, the, the epic is the epic of an already poetic world. The novel is the epic of a world that is already prosaically ordered. It is then, Hegel continues, on this ground and within its own sphere, that it, the novel, regains for poetry the right it had lost, so far as this is possible in view of that presupposition, which is, in other words, Hegel saying it's not possible. Um, it, 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 it seeks to regain for poetry the right it had lost, but because it inhabits a prosaic world, actually it can never regain the rights that poetry has lost, which is why philosophy has to come in, of course, Hegel. Consequently, one of the commonest, this is still Hegel, and for the novel most appropriate collisions, is the conflict between the poetry of the heart and the opposing prose of circumstances and the accidents of external situations. So far as presentation goes, the novel proper, like the epic, requires the entirety of an outlook on the world and life, the manifold materials and contents of which come into appearance within the individual event that is the centre of the whole. 
but in the more detailed treatment and execution here, the emphasis on the detailed in Hegel is interesting at this point, but in the more detailed treatment and execution here, the less the poet can avoid bringing into his descriptions the prose of real life, though without for that reason remaining himself on the grounds of the prosaic and commonplace. Um, the grammar, as always in Hegel, is, is fairly hard to follow, or at least in the English translations of Hegel. Um, but in the more detailed treatment and execution here, the less the poet or the novelist can avoid bringing into his descriptions the prose of real life. So there's a, there's a complicated play in Hegel between the sense of the poetry of Greek epic and the poetic nature of the world which it forms. And uh, precisely because that world is already poetic, in Lukács' terms, form or thinking of form in itself is unnecessary because form simply appears as a kind of imminent and immediate revelation of that poetic world itself. In modernity, however, the world is prosaic um, in both the kind of literal and metaphorical sense for, for Hegel. Famously he describes it as a world of prose. The, the novel's prosaic form then is in some ways a kind of reflection of that world of prose. Not only in the sense that one is written in prose and one is written in verse, but in the sense that the prosaic nature of the novel reflects a world or life that is prosaically ordered, as he puts it, and not therefore poetic in, it, in itself. So form precisely becomes a problem at the point at which um, the would-be poetic form of the novel comes into conflict with um, what he calls the prose of real life. The prose of real life. As is clear in this passage, then, the assertion that the novel is the modern bourgeois epic form contains, as Lukács knows, an inherent and for Hegel self-conscious parallel. The primitive or originary poetic situation out of which the epic proper proceeds designates, Hegel insists, a life which is displaced by one which has as its condition the separation of the individual from a progressively objectified, super-individual and precisely abstract world. To quote Hegel again, the individual, as he appears in this world and pro of world of prose and the everyday, is intelligible not from himself, but from something else. For the individual man stands in dependence on external influences, laws, political institutions, civil relationships, which he just finds confronting him, and he must bow to them whether he has them as his own inner being or not. His inner being, in other words, is, is precisely abstracted from these super-individual um, influences, laws, and institutions. The greatness of the whole event and the total aim appears then only as, Hegel writes, a mass of individual details. Occupations and activities are sundered and split into infinitely many parts so that to individuals only a particle of the whole may occlude. While the epic is thus the poetry of an already poetic world, the novel is, on Hegel's account, impossibly tasked, particularly by romanticism, with a repoeticizing of life, to regain for poetry the right it had lost, but must, in fact, always register the unavoidability of, quote, bringing into its descriptions the prose of real life. It would not be hard to show, then, that under rather different historical circumstances, it is this dialectic that determines, at every point, Lukács' later accounts of not only the novel, but of form more generally. If the Greeks, as Lukács writes in 1910, felt each of their forms available to them as a reality, as a living thing, and not as an abstraction, whereas today we have either abstract form or else there is no form at all, then it's because, as he puts it in the theory of the novel, quote, we have invented the productivity of the spirit. That is why the primeval images have irrevocably, irrevocably man, that's a hard word to say, I um, The primeval images have irrevocably lost their objective self-evidence for us, and our thinking follows, quote, the endless path of an approximation that is never accomplished. The endless path of an approximation that is never accomplished. We have, he continues, invented the creation of forms. And that is why everything that falls from our weary and despairing hands must always be incomplete. So it's a happy book, the theory of the novel. While for the Greeks, form is then strictly not form at all, since it cannot be separated from matter or reality, the modern creation of forms, that is precisely the requirement to make forms, or fiction in the first place, means that all form, by definition, teeters on the edge of incompleteness and, quote, endless path of an approximation that is never accomplished. Perhaps the clearest articulation of this in the early work comes in the dialogue concerning Lawrence Stern, 
titled significantly Richness, Chaos and Form, composed by Lukács in 1909. Written as a dialogue between two students, Joachim and Vincent, each of whom seeks to impress the strikingly handsome girl who acts as their audience, that the gender politics of the dialogue on Lawrence Stern are not great, we'll say. Um, the two sides of the male exchange represent the alternate arguments for the primacy of form or of life in relation to the judgment of Stern's novels. While significantly the winner of the argument remains unresolved in the dialogue, although it is, I guess, um, um, appropriately, the exponent of life who gets the girl in the end, it is the critique of Stern's writing from the perspective of form that is perhaps of most interest here. The dialogue begins with Joachim's comparison of Stern with Goethe, in which the former's work, that is Stern's work, appears from the perspective of the latter as, quote, a confusion of heterogeneous bits and pieces in a raw, disordered state. Stern's prose can be taken only as raw, unprocessed matter, which makes no effort to unify them, to give them form, however imperfect. As such, it fails to, quote, distinguish between value and non-value anywhere. Stern didn't compose his work because he lacked the most elementary prerequisite for composition, the ability to choose and evaluate. Stern's writings are, Joachim argues, a muddy flood of unselected matter. For Vincent, by contrast, it is exactly Stern's richness, fullness, life, which marks him out as a writer to be placed alongside Shakespeare and Cervantes. Against this, Joachim's objections are possible, Vincent argues, only in abstraction, merely formal, he states, running after Stern's sovereign extravagances with an accountant's yardstick. Yet if Tristram Shandy speaks here then for a certain concreteness and richness against the abstractions of form, from another perspective, the formlessness of the novel's prosaic presentation of raw, unprocessed matter has itself a form, albeit an impossible one. As Joachim puts it, such works are, quote, formless because he could have carried on to infinity. And his death meant only the end of his works, but not their completion. Stern's works are formless because they are extensible to infinity, but infinite forms do not exist. I'm just going to read that again as it's crucial for the last part of my argument here. Such works are formless because he could have carried on to infinity, and his death meant only the end of his works, but not their completion. Stern's works are formless because they are extensible to infinity, but infinite forms do not exist. One straightforward reading of the relation of this early conception of the formless to the work of the 1930s onwards that is precisely such a threat than an emphatic conception of realism with its accompanying vocabulary of hierarchy and selection is intended to address. Does, one does not have to follow the dubious conclusions that Lukács draws from this to note, for, therefore, the very real dilemmas concerning the question of form that they thus inscribe. For if prose or the prosaic is the very condition of the novel's modernity as art, it cannot but also register the novel's essential relationship to the character of the opposing prose of circumstances that lies outside of art, as Hegel calls it, and which is constitutive of social modernity's world or life, not only as a bourgeois world, as Hegel would have it, but finally as a world governed by the abstract forms of capital itself. The Hegelian prose of the world becomes here specifically as Lukács puts it in Narrate or Describe, the, quote, domination of capitalist prose over the inner poetry of human experience. The domination of capitalist prose over the inner poetry of human experience. It is this then that resolves that... Well, I've written that wrong. It is, sorry. It is this then that resolves what might otherwise seem at first sight, a problem for Lukács' association of modernism with naturalism, Given that as opposed to the former's association with the abstraction of formalism, as we have seen, the latter, by contrast to realism proper, would appear necessary to be associated with a commitment to the concrete and the particular that is elsewhere seen as definitive of the novel. So, so one of the seeming uh, uh, issues in, in Lukács' account of realism um, is it's kind of bookending by modernism on the one hand and naturalism on the other hand since the obvious point would be that modernism appears to be too abstract, it's the kind of formalism that we've already um, identified, naturalism would seem to be the exact opposite. And naturalism would seem to be defined by being too concrete, too much of a mess of, of, of unselected matter. 
as Stern puts it. In other words, the problem with naturalism is simply that it describes and describes and describes and, and describes concrete particular stuff. Um, so there's an apparent contradiction between um, modernism's abstract formalism and this kind of too much concreteness of um, uh, uh, naturalism. However, Lukács performs, by way of Hegel, a crucial inversion at this point, whereby the seemingly all too concrete prose of description, as exemplified by Zola and carried over into Joyce and others, is said to also mask what is actually a more fundamental abstraction inherent to the prosaic circumstances of capitalism itself. By reducing detail to the level of mere particularity, both modernism and naturalism, Lukács avers, replace concrete typicality with abstract particularity, in which, quote, every person, every object, every relationship can stand for something else. According to a prosaic logic that would endlessly disrupt any conviction, as he puts it, quote, the phenomena are not ultimately transferable. Because it is the ultimate in uniqueness, as Hegel recognised, the here and now, Lukács argues, is absolutely abstract. The craze for the fleeting moment and for the factitious concreteness of 20th century European literature results in abstraction. So this is the kind of turnaround in, in, in Lukács' argument in the 30s is that the, too much, the apparently too much concreteness of naturalism in fact results in abstraction. So there's, a kind of, uh, um, there's a clear kind of flipping here. The question would be then, well, what, what is this abstraction? How does this abstraction then relate to the abstraction that he identifies with, with modernism? The question is then, in what sense is this movement of the unendingly particular, to borrow another of Hegel's own definitions, a specifically capitalist prose, or a specifically capitalist form? Lukács would have to be said is far from explicit about this. Nonetheless, we can at the very least say, I think, that if the novel is the epic form of a world which has become everywhere richer in gifts and dangers than the world of the Greeks, one might ask the question of whether or not the form problem Lukács' term, whether not the form problem of such unending richness is constituted first and foremost by the impossible totality of capital. That is to say, if the novel is the form of literary modernity which carries the fragmentary nature of the world's structure into the world of forms, what else would be the social form of the appearance of formlessness which this generates other than the form of capital itself? One clue to why the social character of apparent formlessness, from Stern to Zola and beyond, should be such a source of anxiety here, would then be the relationship between prose as extensible to infinity, and what Lukács terms, citing interestingly from Benjamin's book on tragic drama, transferability, in which, quote, every person, every object, every relationship can stand for something else. So the relationship between this extension to infinity as, as, a, as a mark of formlessness of incompletion, and what he calls transferability, this capacity of everything to stand for something else, or to be transferable with something else. For in the essential exchangeability of what it joins together, prose's lack of any natural or intrinsic limit on what the novel might depict or incorporate mirrors from the perspective of a later Marxian reworking of the Hegelian bad infinite and bad abstraction, a parallel lack with regard to what can be exchanged in the universalization of, above all, the abstractions of money and the value form. Although this point is only ever implicit in Lukács' own readings, understood in this fashion, the potential formlessness of the novel as prose, generated by the lack of any intrinsic limit on what the work might incorporate, also marks his troubling relation to that indifference with regard to what can be concretely exchanged by the equalizing force of money's abstract regime of generalized equivalence or to the domination of capitalist prose. The, the anxiety, in other words, is not so much one concerning a dynamic of dissolution or unworking of form per se, as it is an anxiety concerning the possibility that form as the social element in modern literature and art might finally be that constituted by capital's own objective production of a new prose of the world through the formation of an increasingly universal equivalence and exchangeability under the domination of the value form. How am I doing for time? Ten minutes? Okay. With a certain amount of caution, we really do need a certain amount of caution here, with a certain amount of caution, we might refer what is at stake in this back to what is probably the earliest philosophical account of the form of money, 
That is Aristotle's discussion of money and exchange in Book One of the Politics, and in particular of the threat the latter poses, according to Aristotle, to the order of the polis and to the proper role within the city-state of oikonomia, economic, economics, but, but, but as associated with domestic for Aristotle, of course, um, as subordinated to political life. Like the formlessness of prose's extension to infinity, exemplified by Stern, famously this concerns for Aristotle, above all, the potential for what Joseph Vogel terms a ruinous escalation, associated with the monetary function in general, and with the spatial extension of trade in particular, whereby the natural limits of commonality, constituted by the form of the polis, are destructively and unnaturally breached. The aberrant use of money, as Vogel puts it, thus raises the spectre of the ruin of the polis and of its communal form. In his fascinating book, Money in the Early Greek Mind, the classicist Richard Seaford suggests that the unsettling effects of monetization, both abstract and concrete, visible and invisible, are located here, in particular, in the collision between the unlimit of money and the limit inherent in ritual. Displacing ritual forms of exchange, the money form produces an abstract and impersonal exchange and circulation of things as a competing and inexhaustible mode of social being. It is this that is taken up in Aristotle's politics, where the unlimited or boundless wealth accumulated through monetary exchange poses a specific threat to the necessary limits of the polis, through which the, we the wealth that is properly adequate to the good life of the political community is measured in its natural end in domestic use. The result is, as Seifert notes, a series of polarities that inform Aristotle's politics, self-sufficiency versus trade, goods versus money, limit versus unlimit, natural bounds versus unnatural accumulation. What Lukács terms modernity's produ productivity of spirit, associated with the onward propulsion of prose and with the necessary invention of forms, is here then equatable to the unnatural potency of money itself and thus of its tendency to expand inf into the infinite and the unbounded. As Benjamin Franklin, quoted in Weber's The Spirit of Capitalism, puts it, money is of the prolific generating nature. Money can beget money, and its offspring can beget more, and so on, without end. In Aristotle's own words, as against the natural order of limits and cyclical return, money-making means, monstrously, the breeding of money. Or, as Vogel puts it in Book One of Aristotle's Politics, quote, in the boundless proliferation of money and its offspring, a spectral double or travesty of the natural order is invoked. An erratic movement is unleashed that perverts the internal dynamic driving the growth and preservation of the political organism. Without then trying to stretch this too far, politically, it is telling in this sense that if modernism is thus associated with a bad abstraction in one guise, a necessity simultaneously to distinguish realism from any such unlimited proliferation of descriptive detail in Lukács' uh, later work, which might otherwise be understood as a drive towards concreteness, also significantly entails the reassertion on Lukács' part of an often surreptitious good abstraction in another. And although Lukács makes reference to Hegel, Marx and Lenin in doing so, the nature of this highest level of abstraction in art, as Lukács makes clear, assumes what is precisely a distinctly Aristotelian character. As Lukács puts it, that the artistic forms carry out the process of abstraction, the process of generalization, is a fact long recognized. Aristotle contest contrasted poetry and history from this point of view. The account then in Lukács' theorization of realism of the inseparable unity of the individual and the universal necessary to form must itself involve a process of good abstraction precisely resistant to the bad abstraction of the potential formlessness of the unendingly particular concrete descriptiveness of naturalist prose. Here then a certain abstraction is intrinsic to form, now uniting the epic with the novel as against both unlimited productivity and what Aristotle is said to designate as history, exactly in its opposition to the formlessness of the prosaic circumstances otherwise given by modernity. To put it another way, the form of formlessness is, from this perspective, the form of accumulation, proliferation, and universal exchangeability, hence of an abstraction of the concrete itself through the domination of social life by the form of value. Ironically, in this sense, formlessness turns out, therefore, to be governed by what, in his reading of Marx, Chris Arthur calls, by virtue of his indifference to an elision of all material content of the objects it exchanges, a world of pure form.
which in the words of the first chapter of Das Kapital, not an atom of matter enters into, and which has no natural limit since as pure exchangeability, there is nothing in principle that it can't relate. As Son Rettel observes, it is in this fashion that Marx may be credited with, quote, the first explanation of the historical origin of a pure phenomenon of form. Um, so this is, this is the oddity I'm suggesting. That's not, it, I'm kind of reading somewhat out of Lukács without it being entirely explicit in Lukács' work, is that the, the, the sense in which the kind of concreteness um, of naturalism, of, 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 of this endless descriptiveness, turns into an abstraction, um, is implicitly linked to this proliferation of, of the money form, to the, the, the unlimited social with the money form, and particularly the money form as it breaks apart the limits of political community. Realism's uh, um, perspective of totality is then precisely that perspective of political community here. Um, naturalism is money's threat to the limits of that political community. The oddity of that, though, is that, of course, as formlessness then, within something like the literary work, this is a formlessness that is, is itself the product of, or formed by, what is, on Marx's own account, a pure form, the most abstract form of all, in other words, the, the form of exchangeability. Since um, the formal nature of exchangeability is precisely that it is entirely indifferent to the material content of what it exchanges. That's then, in, in a sense, how the most apparently most intense concreteness turns here into an intense abstraction. Um, because although the proliferation of detail appears as concreteness, and therefore as this kind of endless formlessness, this formlessness is in, is in fact governed by, or overseen by, its indifference towards the materiality of the objects that it, it, it exchanges. Yeah. Um, I had a long section going into this with, with, with Marx himself, but I'll, I'll skip that. Um, this throws a rather different light on then, for example, in Watt's observation that among the most obvious results of the application of primary economic criteria to, to the production of literature was to favour prose as against verse, whereby bringing it under the control of the law of the marketplace assisted the development of one of the characteristic technical innovations of the form, its copious particularity, description and explanation. As Joachim recounts in Lukács' dialogue on Stern, the latter once said, quote, as a joke, that he would continue his novel to infinity if he could only get a good contract from his publisher. <laughs> Yet this prosaic logic of potentially infinite addition, as Moretti terms it in the modern epic, where there exists no organic fetters to hold it in check, and which is, as he writes of Joyce's Ulysses, capable of connecting everything with everything else, is not only that of mechanical form, as Moretti himself suggests, but is itself reflective formally then of a certain internalization of the logic of the marketplace. We might term the prosaic equivalences of the real abstraction of the value form itself. To the extent that naturalism, as Lukács declares, deprives life of its poetry, reduces all to prose, this is thus far from unique to Zola and his contemporaries, but reflects a tension between the abstract and concrete form and formlessness that is necessarily imminent to the realism of novel as the epic, epic form of a capitalist world per se. One of the consequences of this is then to borrow a formulation from Jameson's recent Antinomies of Realism, that realism's only result could be to destroy realism itself. For in constructing some precarious dialectical balance between narrative coherence and contingency, between the apparently abstract demands of formal shape and the concreteness of the particular, Realism can, under the pressure of capitalist prose, only finally confront the contingent or arbitrary nature of these conventions themselves, which thus come to seem uh, necessarily unrealistic. It is in such terms, Jameson writes, that realism's ultimate adversary will be the realistic novel itself. Yet if this would seem then, from Stern through to naturalism to the current rejection of fiction in Nowsgaard and others, to promote a tendency towards more concreteness, as a resistance to the imposition of abstract form upon lived experience, the hesitancy, as Auerbach writes, of Wolf and Proust to impose upon life an order which it does not possess in itself. At the same time, the crisis of literary concreteness can also be understood as a consequence then of too much contingent detail, and thus an infinite abstract exchangeability or transferability of concrete particulars, unable to get beyond an endless present that is dominated by the social relations of capital. What is not required then to follow Lukács' own evaluative judgments on either modernism or realism or the relationship between them 
to observe in this sense that a good part of what he is grappling with in the right to describe is the ways in which capitalist social forms come to structure the problem of reality or life as an object of representation through the abstract form of money and the commodity itself. It is this that might give us pause, I think, before affirming then not only the current rejection of the fictional as shape, fashion or mould, but also a range of other so-called new materialist or post-critical desires to access what one exponent calls an intractable, unruly reality, somehow freed as a sheer, raw, unprocessed material, in the words of David Shields, from any form. For the abstract social forms of money, the commodity and the value form, do not merely conceal as form the real social relations and objective networks constitutive of capitalism, but on the contrary actually are the real relations that structure capitalist modernity and its increasingly global mode of social life, encompassing human and non-human things alike. Capital produces, in other words, its object world alongside a profoundly new set of social relations and does so all the way down to life or matter as such, which appears therefore less as formless than as themselves already formed by abstractions. And I shall, you'll be grateful to know, end there. Thank you.